don't know if you can tell, but I'm just choosing joy in the fact that this morning I have somewhat of a voice. Yesterday that wasn't the case. And so praise God, I'm kind of here and kind of able to communicate to you this morning. It's kind of important. So just bear with me, hang in there, lean in. Um, but I am choosing joy despite the fact that my throat is on fire. So I'm popping lozenges, I'm drinking water. Um, but I just believe that God has something really powerful that he wants to communicate and he wants to use me for some reason. So I'm um, just going to pray and believe that he's going to flow through me this morning. Because we've been in this series called Choose Joy. And how many of you know that this world needs joy? We need joy in our lives. And so it's so important for us to dig into this and understand not joy or happiness as the world defines it, but as God defines it. And so that's what we've been doing the past several weeks. We've been digging in to the book of Philippians. And Philippians has this overwhelming sense of, it's got this tone of joy all throughout the letter, despite the fact that Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi that he helped start not from a penthouse suite, not from a spa and resort, not even from the comforts of his own home. He's writing this letter from prison. A plus, good job. He's writing this letter from prison. Crazy that he would call us to rejoice and to have joy, but that also tells us something. That tells us that, man, if Paul can tell us and even have joy himself in the midst of those circumstances, maybe I can too. And so week after week, we've been digging into this letter, trying to see how we can apply this to our lives. And so a couple of weeks ago, if you were with us, Pastor Kurt talked about how we can choose joy in the midst of our pain. Joy and pain don't really go well together. (laughs) They're not really buddies. But when we understand God's perspective, we can actually find and experience and choose to have joy even when we go through hard things. And so if you missed that, please go back and check that out. And then last week, Pastor Dustin talked about choosing joy in purpose. And so when God calls us to things, what he calls us to be, what he calls us to do, even when it's hard, we trust that he's working out his purpose in our lives and we can find joy in that. So two really powerful messages looking into each chapter of this letter. So please go back and check that out because I don't have time to digest it all back down to you or download it today. But we're going to jump right in to the next chapter. And believe it or not, let's look at how Paul starts this chapter right off the bat. He says, if you can go and pull that slide up for me, sorry, I'm bouncing around today. But he says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and is a safeguard for you. So he's acknowledging the fact that he's being really repetitive. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. He's like, I don't care that I'm being annoying. I need you to get this. You see that? So he's going to keep bringing up this theme over and over again. I promise you he's not done. If you come back next week, you'll see that. So we're going to continue to talk about rejoicing and choosing joy. But he continues this right at the beginning of this chapter we're going to dig into today. And what we've seen from Paul, going back to what I was going to say just a minute ago, is that his life, he saw his story as an expressed, as, his, as an expressed vision of Jesus' story. He saw Jesus' story and Jesus' life reflected through his very life. It's an expression of Jesus' life. And so he's saying, hey, if Jesus can do this and he can set the way for me and he can lead on this path, I can follow that. And he's encouraging us to do the same, to see ourselves or to see rather Jesus, Jesus' story, Jesus' life reflected in our own. And so it's really exciting because today we're going to talk about joy and progress. It's really the topic of chapter three, joy and progress. Now, if you're anything like me, I immediately think, well, that kind of sounds like a good thing. Yeah, I like progress. (laughs) My wife and I just had um, twin girls almost seven months ago, okay? Beautiful, amazing. I love being a dad. It's one of the best things. It is the best thing ever. But like six months ago, five months ago, uh, any parents in the house? It's kind of rough. Okay. Uh, because we weren't getting very much sleep. Go figure. Like two babies in the house. You're not going to get more than one or two hours strung together at a time. So that was a little tough. Wasn't having a whole lot of joy in that part of it at that time. But wouldn't you know it, as time has gone on, they started putting together three hours or four hours at a time or five. And this past week, I kid you not, both of them have been sleeping through the night. Amen. In Jesus' name. Yes. It's amazing. So I'm finding a lot of joy in that progress. I call that progress. Went from one hour to 12 hours. Ooh, yeah. All right. 
It's amazing, okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. It's pretty easy to find joy in that kind of progress, and maybe you can think along the same lines in your own life. When you, we love to watch things grow. We're wired for that. We love to see things go from zero to nothing. We love to build things. We love to construct things and, and measure our success that way. And that's a good, that, that makes sense. The thing is, though, that we're going to see today as Paul's writing to the Philippians is that the truth is we can actually progress in the wrong direction. Did you know that we can do that? I was thinking back on my time in school many, many years ago. Um, students, you might relate to this. Um, this may have happened, may or may not have happened a couple of times, but when teachers would be assigning homework or there's going to be an exam, we're covering some material in class, right? So I'm, I'm trying to lock in, I'm trying to lean in, make sure I'm paying attention, but sometimes apparently I didn't somehow because I would go home and I would study, say, chapter three of my European literature class or something like that, right? So I'm studying chapter three, I'm, I'm making flashcards, I'm reading all the text, I'm, you know, getting with my friends, making sure I understand what's going on, Right? Only to show up in class and find out, oh, we're, 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 we're covering chapter two today. Uh, I skipped over that part. <laughs> Oops. The thing is, I mastered material, didn't I? I, ma- I made progress in understanding chapter three. But that's not what I'm being tested on. So as much sympathy as my teacher might have for me, unfortunately, I still get an F. Unless I just you know, fake it till I make it. But that's the picture that Paul's painting here is that we can actually succeed. We can actually progress, but in all the wrong ways. And I love the way Francis Chan puts this in his book, Crazy Love. He says this, he says, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. We shouldn't fear, we shouldn't fear failure, but at succeeding at the wrong things. I'm making progress, but when I get to the end of my life, is that progress really going to count for anything? Or am I going to realize, man, I went in the wrong direction? (laughs) So Paul's warning us, and so we're going to see that. So the first part of this text, I'm titling it, Progress Redirected. Progress Redirected. And picking right up in, in verse number two, this is what he says. It starts with a warning. He says, watch out for those dogs those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Okay, so a little context here. So for a first century Jew, this is a brilliant resume. This is beautiful. This is what winning looks like. He's saying, man, if anyone wants to have confidence in their resume, it's me. Look at all that I've done. Look at all my accomplishments. Man, I'm hot stuff. But he starts the whole thing off with what? With a warning. And those, those people he's referring to, he's, he's actually referring to religious people who would say that you still need to continue to keep the law of Moses in addition to your relationship with Jesus. You need to do both. They say, no, 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 that's not it. That's not what Jesus came to do. He came to fulfill the law. So we can't put any confidence in our flesh. It's not that that makes us righteous. It's not that that saves us. So all this shiny stuff that I've done that actually gave me a lot of status and comfort in life and I spent my entire life giving myself to? No, 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 I can't put my confidence in that. He continues in the next verse. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. What would it take for somebody who spent their entire life accumulating a certain amount of success and accomplishment and status to say that's all garbage? I would think it would have to be a pretty radical revelation of something far better than that. 
You track in with that? So imagine your life. Imagine everything that you have accomplished. Maybe you have some medals. Maybe you have some trophies. Maybe you have some achievement awards, some, some papers, some diploma or something. Something you find accomplishment in, something you find pride in. He's essentially saying, I, I throw it all in the burn pile. It means nothing. It's, cr- it's trash. Now, why would he do that? Because the things he's listing out, like we said before, right? He said, righteousness as unto the law, I was faultless. You know, I think a lot of times for us, we come into contact with Jesus. We start a relationship with him, but we don't realize that he not only wants to rid our life of sin, of the things that are blatantly wrong or evil or bad, there's, there's things in our life that are good, that are righteous, and there's really nothing wrong with it except for the fact that it's devoid of relationship with him. And that's what he has a beef with. That's what he has a problem with. He's saying, look, those things are, are, are well and good, but you're putting your confidence in that. No. I count it all as loss. I count it all as trash because I now have Jesus. And I want to point out this really important thing here. It seems to me that he's implying that you can't have it both ways. Because that's kind of what I would, I would want. I kind of want a both and situation, a buffet, if you will, of options here. I want to hold on to my comfort, to my status, to my stuff, to my pride, and yeah, Jesus. Yeah, let's blend the two. But he's saying, he's implying really clearly here that he's given all that up for the sake of knowing Christ. He's given it all up because of Christ. He counts on all loss for that reason. Which means for us, we got to do the same thing. It's not an easy thing to do. And what he's really saying in all of this, to just sum it up in one statement, is that relationship is greater than resume. What really counts is who you know, not what you've done. You've heard it's not who you know, it's what you know. In this case, It's not what you've done. It's who you know that matters most. That doesn't mean what you do doesn't matter at all. Okay, that's a whole other sermon, (laughs) right? Faith without works is dead. We know that. We can table that. We believe that. But devoid of relationship doesn't matter. That relationship is greater than our resume, than our accomplishments. And that's what's going to count. He really echoes Jesus In Matthew chapter 7, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives this kind of chilling statement. Many will say to me on that day, talking about the day of judgment, if you will, the day where you're going to meet him face to face. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name, in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Those are those are good things. Can I get an amen? Miracles, demons fleeing, the scene, in Jesus' name. That's all good stuff. And what does he say? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. (laughs) Okay, are we getting this? So Paul wants to establish this first and foremost. He's reminding them of who they are. He's warning them, look, look, people are going to try to sway you. And even you yourself, your heart is deceptive. It will try to sway you into thinking that it's these good deeds or these things that you do, being in a life group or going to to a growth class or showing up every Sunday. That's what's going to get you there. Just want to remind you, no. (laughs) It's all about relationship with him. And out of that will flow all of those things, but we got to keep our priorities straight. We got to pursue the right thing. And the the thing is, is that really when he boils it all down, progress is knowing Christ. That's what progress really is. The kind of progress that matters most is marked by our proximity to Jesus. So we can rest assured knowing not that we're making progress, the more that we accomplish, the more we succeed, the more, that pe- the more people that pat us on the back, we all love that. I had a lot of people after the first experience, you know, encourage me, and that feels really good. Not going to lie, it does. But I can't put my confidence in that. What matters most is, am I really close to Jesus, or am I just standing up here trying to preach a really impactful sermon? I'm going to have to account for that one day, and we all are. So that's what Paul is wanting to say to us here. He wants to make sure that we get it. And so 
when we come to terms with that, I think we can still find joy in the idea of knowing Jesus. In some ways, maybe it even seems like a relief. It's like, man, okay, so it's not about what I do. It's about who I know. Okay, cool. So in that case, I don't have to feel all this weight and this pressure to like perform for him. Like he's already done all the work. Amen? Like he's done all the work so I can just get to know him. Awesome. That's great. I can find joy in that. But unfortunately, Paul keeps writing. Okay, so (laughs) he keeps going and I don't really like the next part. Not gonna lie. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Good. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I want to know Jesus, right? Like, I want to know, like, the person who cuts my hair or the person who, like, scans my groceries or the, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I want to be an acquaintance with Jesus, but whoa, I'm going to become like him in every way? That's a whole other thing we're signing up for. <laughs> That's exactly what Paul is talking about. Maybe you've heard this statement that you become, like, the five people that you spend the most time with or that you are the sum total of the people you spend the most time around. That's the kind of relationship Paul is talking about here with Jesus. He's saying, I want to be so close to Jesus that I don't only know him, but I, I look like him. That my story is, is an expression of his story, a lived expression of his story. That in every way I would be like Christ. He doesn't want to stop with just, just the acquaintance. He doesn't want to leave it there. He wants, he wants to go all in. Now that's, that's a lot. And this is where it gets hard. And this is why we're talking about progress. <laughs> Because the truth is, it gets really hard when we get to this point. And it's hard if we submit to this to choose joy all the time. Because progress equals knowing Christ equals becoming like Christ. And that's no small task. Because <laughs> when, I, when I met Jesus or when he found me, I didn't really look anything like him. <laughs> and maybe he didn't either. So the process of becoming like him, man, that's... That seems like a lot, a lot to chew. But what we need to understand is that if we want the power of Jesus, the blessings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the good things that come along with knowing him, we have to accept participation in his sufferings. Look at this verse again. I want to know Christ. Yes, know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Power and participation. That's what makes it worth it. Because <laughs> so far it just sounds like, man, like, okay, like, where's the cell in this whole thing? Like, why would I want to do that? Like, why would I want to sign up for that? He, he's saying because, man, having access to all of Jesus, all that he has to offer, why wouldn't I want that? The only thing is it's going to cost you something. And Paul says, like we already read, that the alternative is, is far worse, that there's surpassing worth in knowing Jesus. So before you get too discouraged, let's keep going. Okay, we'll keep digging in because what we need to understand today, what we're signing up for today is a process. Progress is a process. There's a big difference in tone when I say, man, we're making progress. Yes. I can't even like, can you do a woo for me? I can't. Woo. I can't get it out. <laughs> um, the big difference between that and saying, yeah, it's a process. Uh, it's getting there. You see the difference? But true progress that leads to the destination that we actually want to go to requires a process. Look at what Paul continues to say in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Process. Process. And I I got to experience this in a real personal way the last year in my own life, and I didn't even really realize it until my wife and I were talking about all this. We started talking about kind of what we've been through really what she's been through, more than, 
way more than me, um, in the birth of our twins, okay? So about a year ago right now, we just found out that she was pregnant. And let me tell you, when we found out that information, there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of joy. We were super excited. We were like, man, this is crazy. This is a miracle. And then you get the, the added bonus of being able to tell you start telling people. You start telling your friends. You start telling your family. And man, their response just like energizes you. And it's so exciting. And you start thinking about all the possibilities and what that's going to mean for your future. But it's all like rosy shades, right? And then you find out you're having two, okay? Which is a little overwhelming, but also mind-blowingly amazing. And so you start telling people, not only are you having one baby, we're having two babies. So just marked by joy that whole season. But then there comes a day, and I can't relate, but moms, you can. There comes a day when you wake up a little nauseous, <laughs> okay? And that happened. And that's when the process began. <laughs> that's when the process began. So I'm watching my wife, I get a front row seat, go through all of this stuff, the nausea and the sickness and the exhaustion and the fatigue. And the thing is, like, there was nothing to show for it. Like, she's going all th through all this stuff, but she's got nothing to show for it. Nothing to rejoice in. Except for this hope that, yeah, so there's something happening, I believe, that's going to make all this worth it. And so you go through this process of just believing that having to cling to that faith, even though every day is a grind. Waking up every morning sore and struggling to get up to go to work and stand all day and on and on and on. But then you got another appointment and you get to see the baby again in a sonogram, Right? And you see, man, there's actually something there. There's something growing. I can see progress now. I can see change happening before my eyes. Man, that life is happening. Because you can't see beneath the surface what's going on. But that puts wind in your sails, and it gives you joy, and it gives you a boost to keep going, to stay the course, right? And so we do that. But then it's just this vicious cycle where most days are just like, it's, it's hard. There's something that's difficult about it, something that's challenging about it, but the only reason you can maintain a semblance of joy in it is that you know, man, this is, this is leading me somewhere. Like, this is going to end one day, <laughs> and it's going to be really good. And so, fast forward months and months and months, and she's growing and stretching, and it's getting more painful, and those last few weeks are just demoralizing and, and awful, and you want to pull your hair out of it, just waiting, like, what is this going to happen? Like, eating spicy Thai food for no reason, because it didn't work, and, you know, all this other stuff that you try to do to just get this thing rolling, but that moment came, and you get to the hospital, and there's nothing like that moment. And I got to tell you, I wasn't thinking about any of the hard days. And I'll speak for her, okay? This must be real. It wasn't that hard for me. Okay. Um, it's actually kind of fun. Um, but I, I guarantee you in that moment, we're looking at each other. We're waiting for that moment to come. That day, you're there. You know it's, it's going to happen right now. All you're thinking about is that moment. And it's filled with emotion and with joy and all your hard labor is paying off. You're not thinking about all that stuff that you went through. And then you get two babies. End of story. It's awesome. It's the most beautiful thing. Like, it's the most incredible thing. Five minutes later, I was like, okay, let's do this again. Let's roll. And she was like, no, no, no. We're going to take some time, which I understand. But, but it, was, it was that amazing. It was incredible. You want to relive that over and over again because you realize, man, that was, that was worth it for me. But I'm speaking for her. She, she agrees. I, I checked. It was worth it. All the pain, all the hard days, it was worth it. And so now look back at what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm not just putting myself through all this hard stuff for no reason. I'm not happy in this prison because I like to be in a prison. Like, I like the prison food. It's really good. That's not what he's rejoicing in. He's rejoicing in the fact that his hope is going to be revealed in the future. It's an investment. And he thinks, he believes with all of his heart, it's a conviction that's far better than what he used to find pride in and what he used to cling to. Life is like one long big pregnancy and labor. <laughs> it really is. And the difference between a real pregnancy and, and life is that that's nine months or so. This is like forever, okay? He's just signing up forever for a lifelong process of having moments of joy. You know, when Christ finds you, 
and he meets you where you are, and you're like, I can't believe this. Are you kidding me? Like, you'll take me as I am right now? Like, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to perform. I don't need to clean myself off first. No, no, no. He, he, you're going to take me now? There's a lot of joy in that moment, that initial moment of finding out, man, I'm saved. Like, I've been redeemed. I've been set free. And you want to tell everybody about it. You want to bring all your friends to church and convert the world. You're excited. But then you start hitting your first bumps in the road, the first battle, the first challenge. And over time, it wears you down. And you need that, that initial joy, that moment to remind you that it's worth it to keep pressing on, to keep pushing forward. And then God is so good, he's so gracious that he'll give us, he'll give us glimpses, he'll give us moments where he reminds us that he's still working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. And then he, he lets us feel it. He does a miracle in our life. He answers a prayer for us. He moves in our life and reminds us, I'm still here. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still here. That baby's still kicking, okay? It's going to be worth it. So looking at verse 18. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. When our mind is set on earthly things, our destination is destruction. And he's got tears in it. I mean, he's emotional sharing this news. He's saying, look, please, like, it's so much better to know Christ than to hold on to that stuff or to pursue the things of this world. And he reminds them again what that prize is our citizenship, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 20, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. God is actually going to conform us into the image of Jesus. He actually is going to do that if we'll submit to that process. If we'll trust him in the process, if we'll be patient in the process, even when it's hard, even when it's long, even when it doesn't make sense, even when we're tired, even when we're broken, he'll do that. He'll make it happen. I love the way that Paul wraps this up in another letter that he writes to the Corinthians. And it's just so perfect. <laughs> so I want to wrap up with this. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. It really looks like I'm in a process on the outside because I am. It's not always pretty. It's hard. But inwardly, being renewed day by day by day by day. He's working. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, or not, not on what is seen, but on, on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's going to last forever. So it all boils down to this. Do you trust or do you not trust that God is working in your progress? That even when it doesn't look like progress, it feels way more like just a grinding, grueling process that he's doing something. And that it's worth having that way more than it is clinging to the comforts of this life that we can't have and also have what God wants to give us. That's the decision that we have to make. So from all angles, Paul is trying to, to capture this. We can, we can progress in the wrong directions. We've got to understand that we're in a process here and there's a prize at the end. There's a reward at the end. The process is producing something. It's working. 
It's working. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me this morning? I think there's a few different ways that we can respond. Because maybe you've been clinging to a resume. Maybe you've been putting all your stock in what you do. It's comfortable, it's familiar, you're in control. We can respond this morning if we're in that place by letting go, counting that as loss so that we can have Jesus. As I promise you, Jesus is better. He's better. It's not worth it. So choose the joy of letting go of all that stuff, finding your sense of pride in there and boast in what Jesus is doing in your life. And maybe you're in the process right now. Like you're in it. You're with me. You're saying, man, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm in a battle. I'm fighting. I'm grinding. I'm working. I'm trying. But you've grown weary. You're tired. You're worn down. You're frustrated. You don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It seems like it's never going to end. And it does not seem like God is working. I'm here to tell you he is working. Just like Paul says, take heart. Be encouraged. It may seem one way, but it really is another way because our citizenship is in heaven. We're not even from here. This isn't our home. This This isn't real compared to what's to come for us. So take heart. Be encouraged. Trust that he's working all things together for your good as you follow him and submit your life to him. And maybe, just maybe, there's someone in here today that's thinking to themselves, like, I'm not in any kind of process whatsoever. Like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here. What better time to start this process of knowing Jesus? When you realize the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus— It's an easy gamble. It's an easy trade. Because it's so much better. (laughs) And those who have made that sacrifice, who have chosen to participate in the sufferings, will tell you, it's so much better. This is what I was made for. This is what I live for. It's worth it. And I don't think there's any better way to kick that off than with what we're going to do right now, which is, Take communion together. We're going to remember that's not because of us. It's because of Jesus that we're here this morning. It's all because of his work. It's all because of what he's done. If I have Jesus, I have everything I need. And as we do this, we're going to be singing this song, and it says, all I know is everything I have means nothing if Jesus isn't my one thing. So that's what we're going to do right now in this moment. Just, I want to invite you, kind of in your own personal bubble, just to respond on your own, in your own way, just you and the Lord. I, play, I pray and believe that he's speaking to you. He's working on your heart. He's got something he wants to say to you. There's, you see yourself somewhere in this narrative. There's a part of this that applies to you. Take that in. So at this time, as the band gets ready to come behind me, we have four stations with the elements, two in the back, two in the front. And we serve an open communion here, which means if you have a relationship with Jesus or you want to start one, please, please come. And grab those elements and come back to your places, and then I'll lead us through that time. And please, sing along with us. Participate in this moment. We'll bring it to a close. Go ahead and come.